Bull and Bloom's Inside the Album. More info at bullandbloom.com. On February 22nd, 1986, Ozzy Osbourne released his fourth studio album, The Ultimate Sin. The album peaked at number six on the Billboard 200, reaching platinum status by May 14, 1986. It was later certified double platinum on October 26, 1994, and eventually sold over 2.5 million copies in the U.S. alone, and nearly 4 million copies worldwide. Following the Bark at the Moon tour, Ozzy was admitted to the Betty Ford Clinic after his drink and drug addiction got out of hand. While Osborne was being treated, writing sessions for The Ultimate Sin began in Palm Springs with bassist Bob Daisley, guitarist Jakey Lee, and drummer Tommy Aldridge. On entering rehab, Ozzy said, I phoned them and said I'm coming in. The woman asked me, what drugs are you doing right now? I told her booze and coke. She said, I want you to keep doing them until you get here. Well, I thought, fucking hell, this is going to be a great place. Sharon told me it was a club where they would teach me to drink like a gentleman. I got there and asked Betty where the bar was. On the writing sessions for the album, guitarist Jakey Lee said, on the ultimate sin, while Ozzy was in the Betty Ford Center, I got a drum machine, one of those mini studios, a bass from Charvel, a really shitty one, and I wrote more or less entire songs. I didn't write melodies or lyrics because Ozzy is bound to change things, but I wrote the riff and came up with the chorus, verse, bridge, and solo sections. Then I wrote the drum and bass parts I had in mind. I put about 12 songs down on tape like that, and when Ozzy got out of the Betty Ford Center, I said, here you go. Here Here's what I got so far, and I'd say half of it ended up on the album. Jake, Jake's come out, of, come out of his shells amazing on this new album. It's, it's like it burst forward in such a degree. It's like I mean, he did it's so much work. I mean, you know, I always call the Ozzy Osbourne album. It was justifiable to call it the Ozzy Jake album because he did so much work on it. You know, Jake did as much more than anybody really. Bassist Bob Daisley added. Ozzy was in the Betty Ford Center for rehabilitation off drugs and alcohol and all the rest of it. He used to come out on a day pass to rehearse, but it was mainly Jake and I. We were putting songs together musically and all that. When we got back to London, we were looking at drummers since Tommy had left to join Whitesnake. One day, Ozzy and I had a bit of a fallout. We had to go into the studio to record four songs just so the record company could hear what we were doing. A lot of the rehearsal time, Ozzy didn't show up. It was just me and Jake and various drummers just keeping the beat as we put the stuff together. And then Ozzy showed up at the studio. He started drinking again and smoking pot and all the rest of it. Once he got into the frame of mind where he wasn't straight, he wanted to make changes. I said, Ozzy, we have just one weekend to do four songs and get them recorded and mixed and out the door to the record company on Monday. I started to get a bit annoyed with him since he was wanting to change things. I said, if you're not happy with it and want to make changes, maybe you should have gone to rehearsals. That was it. He got all pissed off. You can fuck off and take that Jake with you. That's what he said. I don't know what Jake had done, but later I got a phone call from Ozzy saying, we can't work together. That was it. I was gone. But then about a month later, Ozzy phoned. He had Phil Susan playing bass then. He goes, well, can you write the lyrics? I thought, well, I've already put a lot of the songs together with Jake. I may as well do the lyrics. Otherwise, I might as well get fucked out of everything. There was no offer of, you worked on all the other songs and here's your offer. There wasn't even an offer to give me credit. There was none of that. So I said, okay, I'll write the lyrics. Ozzy would send me tapes of his melodies and phrasing for the songs. And so I sat at home, wrote the lyrics, and took them to Ozzy in London from time to time. He loved them all and used them. That was it for the album. I helped put the music together with Jake, and I wrote all the lyrics. Although Phil Susan used some of the bass lines that I'd written when Jake and I wrote the music, they weren't delivered in a way that I would have performed them. I wasn't impressed with the rhythm section on that album at all. The best thing about the whole record was Jakey e. Lee, who played great as always, but the overall thing just hadn't gelled and hadn't been tastefully executed. Ozzy called it the ultimate din instead of the ultimate sin. And then the first pressing came out, and I didn't even get a mention. Nothing. Not even my songwriting credits or anything. And the first half million had shipped. They came and went without my credit. And then they fixed it, and it kept on selling. But the first half million went out without my credit. 
On trying to write while sober, Ozzy said, I've tried. Nothing comes out. If I try and write straight, I can't fantasize. I need a drink to get the imagination working. After writing almost all the music on Ozzy's previous album, Bark at the Moon, and not receiving songwriting credit, Jakey Lee demanded a change. On The Ultimate Sin, I did get credit because I got fucked out of the first one. I was promised that I would get credit. Because I was young and I was in the middle of Scotland recording, I didn't have a manager or a lawyer. It was just me. From the beginning, every musician, it's always hammered into them. Keep your publishing and keep your writing. So the only conditions I had was, okay, I'm getting songwriting credit, right? I was always assured that, yes, I'm getting publishing. Of course you are. When I didn't on the first record, it was upsetting. But I figured, okay, what am I going to do? I got fucked. What am I going to quit? We're about to tour on a record that I finally got to make. There's no problem for Ozzy to find another guitar player. Am I just going to be that guy that played on the record, didn't even get credit on the record, and then refused to tour because I had a problem with Ozzy? No, I had to go out and tour. It would have been stupid not to. So I was only able to put my foot down at the end of the tour. Let's make another record. And I was like, okay, but this time, you know what? I want the contract first before we start recording. I don't want to be a dick, but I don't want to get fucked again either. Prior to drummer Randy Castillo joining Ozzy's band, Jimmy DeGrasso served as the initial replacement for Tommy Aldridge. What happened was, they flew me over to the UK, and the band at the time was me, Jakey Lee, and Bob Daisley. We had our own house, we all had our own floor, so we were writing and recording for about two months. Obviously, as always, there was some discord in the camp, but we recorded, I think it's either five or six songs. And then Bob and Ozzy had a falling out, and Bob was let go. And then we had a couple of other bass players come in, and at one time we had Neil Murray from Whitesnake. So it was me, Jake, and Neil Murray, and we kept writing. It's funny because I have all these versions. I think some of those songs wound up on the first Badlands record. Well, the album's actually out now. It's gone top ten in America. It's starting mm. to go in the charts all over the world. Finally. <laughs> in actual fact, it's, it's now entered the, Amer um, the German charts, which is the first time ever. And I've never had a record that's doing so well in Germany. I think it's really up to 100,000 sales now. It, it's a very upfront album, isn't it? I mean, I think, pro in my opinion is it's probably rockier than anything you've done in quite a while. Would it's, you agree it's, with that? It's, it's rockier, but it's, a, it's very... Uh, using Ron Nevison as, as a producer, it's, it's come a kind of Americanized sound, which I don't know whether I like or whether I don't, but I can't complain because it's doing so well. You know? Despite the album's commercial success, Osborne cites The Ultimate Sin as his least favorite solo album, saying... If there ever was an album I'd like to remix and do better, it would be The Ultimate Sin. Producer Ron Nevison didn't really do a great production job. The songs weren't bad, they were just put down weird. Everything felt and sounded the fucking same. There was no imagination. I was happy with it, Jake E. Lee said. I do agree that maybe The Ultimate Sin should be remixed, because it was a bit of a poppy mix, but Ozzy wanted to increase his fan base at the time. Ron Nevison gave it more of a poppy thing, but it's a heavy record, so I think it should be remixed. Let's have an alternative mix of that. I would hope he'd invite me to do it. During a recent interview with Ron Nevison, the producer talked about The Ultimate Sin, saying... Not being a fan of Ozzy, I can't really tell you that I've ever listened to those other albums. I remember recording at the townhouse in London. One of the quirky things was that Jakey e. Lee, the guitar player, an album like that is 90% guitar and the rest vocals once the tracks are cut. He said to me, hey Ron, I really play way better at night. Can we work at night? I said, well yeah, okay. What time do you want to start? And he said, can we like start at midnight? And I went, no, we can't do that. I can't expect this staff at Townhouse Studios to totally turn their time all around. I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll start at 6 o'clock at night and work from 6 p.m. till 2 in the morning. And he was great. It's not like he was into drugs or anything like that. He was into martial arts. We whipped through the guitars and had a good time doing it. But then it came to Ozzy's vocals. He wasn't turning up. He was staying at home, getting drunk, just being Ozzy. So I went to his wife and said, we're going to have to do something here. I said, I think it would be best if I took him somewhere and recorded so I'd have a captive audience. I said, where could we go? She says, well, he hates France. You can take him there and he'll come back real quick. So I got a studio in Paris for 10 days and we went over there. 
Ozzy Me and this 10-foot tall minder, and we did his vocals. There was a little bit of a wobble there. One day he disappeared, but I think we did like six days. I lost him for the seventh, and then I got him for the other three. We got it all done. But I do remember a funny incident. I didn't realize when I got to the studio that it was on the other side of Paris from where we were staying. The traffic was so horrendous on the first night, it took us an hour to get to the studio from the hotel. Anyway, we ended up taking the metro, which is the subway. That's how we got to the studio every day. We took the subway. It was only 15 minutes instead of an hour. The Ultimate Sin Tour launched in the U.S. on March 27, 1986, with Metallica as the opener, who had just released their album Master of Puppets on March 3rd. Regarding the tour, Jakey e. Lee said, The Ultimate Sin Tour... That's where we had to dress a certain way. Ozzy had that gold glitter, big shoulder thing going, and he had a guy that made clothes for everybody. You couldn't dress yourself if you were in Ozzy. Not back then. You had to go to this clothing designer. I remember seeing Ozzy's outfit, seeing the bass player's outfit, and I was like, damn, if I have to wear this shit, can you please just mute it down? I mean, most of my shit is black and white. There's no glitter, and I still felt uncomfortable. And I remember one of Sharon's things was, you can't dress like the punters. You can't be on stage and look like you could also be in the front row. When I joined, she told me that. I remembered that, but I didn't think we had to go that far. And I love that Metallica went out in jeans and t-shirts and just fucking tore it up. After The Ultimate Sin came out, Lars Ulrich came up to me and said, Thank you and congratulations. Ultimate Sin is the heaviest song Ozzy's ever done. I love it. Ozzy's tour wrapped up on February 23rd, 1987 and ended up being Jakey e. Lee's final performance with the band. If you'd like to learn more about why Ozzy fired Jake, click the link in the description. Mm-hmm.